Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm honored that, um, that Jim invited me to, to ask him some questions. And uh, when, we, when we spoke on the phone and uh, about doing this, he said, well, you sound very peppy. <laughs> and it was all I could do not to say pretty peppy party pal. Um, <laughs> Because I, like, like I'm sure all of you, like many writers, are, um, I feel steeped in Jim's work. And in fact, when I went back to, um, to review the movies, it turns out I had seen all of them in the theater, um, except for Terms of Endearment, because my mother didn't want me to see the, uh, the sad part. Um, <laughs> so what, what I was going to do, um, I, f I feel like if we went chronologically, we would be here for a long time, because... As all of you know, any four or five years of Jim's career would be enough for most writers for the, their entire lives. Um, and there's so much to cover. And I, and I was hoping we could approach it from sort of, well, frankly, the questions that I wanted answered. <laughs> um, and um, so there, there'll, there'll be, um, I'm going to start out where I think most, most people would be interested. It's, where you started, and there's something that you said um, in an interview, which was, you said, we have a billion brain cells. I didn't have one that told me it was possible to make a living as a writer. And my question is, at, at what point in your life did you realize it was possible to be a writer, and when did you allow yourself to say, I am a writer? Um, I, <laughs> the, 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 tr the truth is that it's difficult tonight a, li a little bit. And it's because I'm in the process of writing, so it's a very weird <laughs> evening for me. And you know, it's uh, but but I I find that the one thing that you think is the str that that you're nuts because you have this thought in your head. Uh, but when somebody says, "What do you do for a living?" and you say, "I'm a writer," and to try and say it that smoothly, "I'm a writer," <laughs> instead of "I'm a writer," and you give away <laughs> the lie that of course you're not a writer because of the way you say you're a writer. And I and I and I think that took me about 25 years. But did. Did you have a moment where you looked around and said, this is it? I had a moment where, where I noticed that it, I had said it well, that I, you know. <laughs> that you would, yeah. 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 Um, what, what do you consider or do you consider any moment your big break? And it doesn't have to be an early moment in your career, but any moment that you thought, this is a break? You know, I think, I think getting, a, getting my first job on a television show, which was a show called My Mother the Car, which is, which is a much, <laughs> there you go, that's, that's, that might be the last hand that show ever gets. <laughs> um, uh, I, I was working on documentaries and I went, to, and I, struggling and s mostly unemployed, and I, and I went to a party um, on New Year's Eve with a, a friend of mine whose literal name was Bud Weiser, that's what it said on his, birth certificate. <laughs> and, um, and he worked at Walper Documentaries with me, and I was working intermittently there. And then a guy walked in in a, in a tuxedo. We were all scruffy. And he walked in a tuxedo, and his wife in a gown. They looked great, and he was great looking. And it turns out it was Alan Burns, who had two shows on the air at the time. And, and I spoke to him, and, um, and he, it was this crazy thing, and he, and he said, let me tell somebody that you want to be a writer, <laughs> and, and I'll see what I can do. And he actually, through him, he helped get me a rewrite job. And that rewrite job was an extraordinary break for me. Did he read a script of yours first? Did you have I don't respect? think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, you know, it was New Year's Eve. <laughs> it was <laughs> so it was all, it was all <laughs> yeah, Bud Wiser. I, I, I think so. A, yeah. I think so. Um, You've also said that in many ways the best way to approach the work is, is when you're naive, when you don't know what the pitfalls are. And are there any instances in your career where you just feel like you didn't know any better or you would not have done the good thing? That were there any opportunities that were afforded you because you My didn't know My first directing is, 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 is where it really hit me, my first directing job. And, and, when, it, and when it comes to um, writing, uh, do you guys know who Steve Gordon is? Who, uh, you know, uh, Steve Gordon was like brilliant writer. He wrote and directed one screenplay, Arthur, and uh, and died at a very young age. And I worked with Steve Gordon. He was in, he was the advertising wunderkind. He had done the Barney's ad that won every award that year with a big joke at the end. And I worked with him on a on a 
on a, I forget which show, but on a, on a three-camera show, and it was the first time he had a show of his, a script that was being made into a television show, and as a courtesy, we allowed him to sit as part of the 18 chairs that spread out in that stage when you have a run-through. And, and usually that person never talks, and Steve said, they're in the wrong places during a scene. <laughs> they're in the wrong places, and he was right. The joke didn't work unless the actors were in different positions, and it was just that's the way it was in his head. And I, I think that's the great insight into why writers should consider directing. And when you, when you directed, did you feel like you were free to do some, the first time you were free to do some things because you didn't know? I didn't know, you know, I didn't know. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, and uh, I, my, the, first, the first, it was my screenplay and Jack Nicholson was in it. And, um, and he used to come up behind me and he was, and it was great. And he'd say, "You want to know the worst direction you gave today?" <laughs> and 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 he and he and he'd tell me. And and then every once in a while, he said, "You know, you don't want to know something good you did today." And it was, and he made it loose for me. And he was extraordinarily supportive because we had some very difficult times on that picture. And 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 his support really got me through. But and now that you've experienced the business from from writing and directing and producing all that aspect, do you feel like you're still able to approach things from that naive standpoint? No, at all? I mean you can't hold. On. There are things you're not allowed to. You cling to them. They they hit your hands, and you know you know somehow you let them go. You just can't keep that up. But certainly, I don't know any writer who doesn't have. The, f the feeling of acute impotence every time they every start time. something new. You, do you have that? Yeah, do you feel like when you, you, you open a new thing and you think, oh, I, I have no idea how to do this? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, know, you, know, you know, yeah, and I'm just, and, I, and I'm trying to remember this because I remember after the wild success of Arthur, I knew a guy who went to Steve Gordon and it was a wild success. I think the New York Times called him the American Noel Coward. I mean, you just don't do better. And, um, and he was unhappy. And it was a wildly successful movie. And they said, why, I think, I th think this is how it goes. And they said, your picture is the biggest picture in the box office. He says, I know. And, and it's gotten better reviews than anybody has gotten in I don't know how long. And he says, I know. He says, then why are you unhappy? And he says, I forgot how I did it. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? And do you, do you feel that way? Now, you said you're writing something new. Do you feel that way when you're... I think you pick up something that, you know, for want of a better expression, you can call craft, I, I think. You pick up something. You, you pick up, you know, but I, I, I used, you know, I work with writers with, a, you know, and I used to, I, Sid Field had a book came out where he, where he had a diagram of a screenplay and, and, basic, and basically I think it boils down to something has to happen on page 30, something better happen on page 60 and 90. Right. And, and we used to s just pour over that chart. It was so great <laughs> to have a rule. It was so great to have a fix. And you used it? Yeah, I use it all the time. Yeah. You'll use it now. You can't yeah. forget yeah. it once yeah. somebody yeah. says it. <laughs> um, all right, so I was going to ask you a little bit about your TV, the TV stuff. On Mary Tyler Moore, you had seven major characters. Um, what were the challenge of challenges of working with such a big ensemble? And do you do you? It, yeah. it wasn't a challenge. It was it was my, that was my college. It was the, it was it was the great education. We had seven actors, all of whom had in common that they could get big laughs. All came from a different discipline. All had a different approach to acting, and I think that was my and 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 Mary was great, and 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 she let the I mean she let the inmates run the asylum. She supported us, and um, and that was you just. Learn, I mean, it was just amazing learning experience for me. It was great. I mean, it was, it, it was certainly. How did you come to have such a large ensemble? Was that always something you'd imagined, or did yeah, it just sort of grow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I don't know. We, people joined. We kept on adding them on Taxi. You know, we kept on adding characters, and it was the almost the best thing about that experience. Um, yeah. Do you think it's possible to do a show today with that many um, characters? That yeah, many? You think I do. There's nothing about the. Because that's a very selfless um, from your star to have, you oh. know, to sort of <laughs> <laughs> have so many other characters be. Yes, take, I, think take their turn. I, I think I think it's, it's possible. possible. Even on reflection. <laughs> um, we were talking about this earlier. You said that when you wanted to move from TV to movies, that there was sort of a a steel curtain there. Um, and how did you go about overcoming that, or? I don't, I th I'm trying to forget who, who made it over first. I, I, you know, it was, there was an, it, it's so hard, I mean, I swear to you, there, it, was, it was impossible for a television writer or director 
to get, and most, and probably actor, but Steve McQueen had made it over. There are some people who, had, actors, had made it over the wall. But it was impossible for the rest of us just because once you worked in television, that was it. it and it was, you know, I think it was true up until the early 70s, I think, uh, late 70s maybe. Do you know? It was, it was absolute for, I think, a, a long, long time. And, um, and, and suddenly it just gave way. You know, I, 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 don't think, I don't think there was some stunning thing that happened. I don't think there was somebody, I think I was an early guy to, to come from television and do a movie. I, uh, you know, I, I, think that, I think that happened. I was one of the early ones, but it was, uh, it just, at a certain point, they were open to it. And you, you wrote one screenplay that you didn't direct before you started yeah. directing. And did you, was it, was there something about that experience of not being able to direct it that inspired you or made you feel like, I'm going to have to do it myself? I, I wrote it and I produced it and I courted the director and I picked him myself and he was a great director and I, I bless his memory and I was banned from the set on day two. <laughs> 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 and I was because I couldn't not be communicating with the actors. I mean, my face showed it and they'd start to look at me and, and, he, and, and he, said he, he, he said a great thing to me. He said, Jim, when you're directing, you don't need to know everything. You need the illusion that you do. And you know, and, and that was oh, it. So I, and, I was, illusion, and I was banned for it. And I came right. back and helped work on editing the film. He was great to me, but I c he couldn't keep me on the set, and I understand why. And when you were do when you were writing for television, you you weren't directing those, you didn't direct those. So you uh, also were. But you got involved in it. You, 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 were, you, were, you, you had to make the final decision. You had the final responsibility. Yeah. And that's how the way did it is you today. how do you communicate with the actors on a television series in a way that's? I, I, I used to annoy you know like people like Jay Sandridge, who's such a wonderful director because you know because he want us to give our notes to him and he'd give them to the actors and I I would violate that more often than not, I, you know, because it, it was just easier to talk directly to the actors. Is that something, that as time went on, you got more used to doing, or? It seemed natural to do it. It seemed natural. It, 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 it was my impulse. It is my impulse. Of being on a set and working with actors, and you had had a lot of experience with that even before you started directing. Yeah, yeah. And, and having the responsibility, that's a big deal. You know, because it, it, I think the hardest transition to make is, you know what that guy should be doing, you know what he should be doing, you know what he should be doing, and then suddenly you say, do this, is an enormous, uh, you know, enormous transition. To actually be the person who goes yeah, over yeah, and, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, in television, you have what you, you, you've called a community of work. Do you feel that you lack that when you were writing movies? Do you miss that? Well, I have it some on The Simpsons. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I still have it some on The Simpsons where... But you when you're doing features, do you feel yes, in the process, you, you feel the, yes, the lack yes, of that? Yes, yes. And are there any... Um, Though some people manage, I think Judd Apatow manages to have that community while he works. And, you know, the way he describes it, it's exactly my experience in television. And, and he's, he's made it possible for his movies. Of having a room. Yeah. Um, but when you're, you, you... When you're working on your own on your feature stuff, you feel like you miss that. Do you have people that you involve in the process, or that you send your work to, and that you talk about you, it with? You try. It's it's it, you know it's hard to find the right person. You, you, yeah, you try. I do. I do. You know you have. You have some readers that you trust. And well, no, you know, not some. I mean, it's always <laughs> <laughs> very. It's it's yeah. You know, you have yeah. When you when you're worried about something and does this stink, you need somebody to tell you. Right. Um, this is something I'm, I'm very interested in. The in the half hour, jokes are very important, and it's you know some to make sure that you have particularly jokes at the end of scenes, and you know that's very important. And in features, um, the the hard joke. Wh what do you think is the role of the joke in the, in a movie script as opposed to a TV script? I think when a movie has a joke that's a ten. It's a very big deal. It's very hard. It's like, you know, it's Moby Dick. It's very hard to find that 10, to go fishing for that 10. And those 10s happen like in, uh, in you know, I'll have what she's having. Right. Is like, is, is, is right. you know, is extraordinary. It's a perfect it's, joke. It's, right. it, it's a perfect joke and, 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 and it lifts the film to its highest perch. I think without that joke, it would have been a wonderful film. But with that joke, it's burned into your memory, you know. Mm -hmm. and. and uh, and why is it different to find it 
in a in a movie. Do you feel like there's jokes that are too big that would work on a television set? That well, because work in, in a, a way you're serving a s somewhat different God, and in, 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 well, certainly in that picture, in Harry and Sally, you know, it, it's a you know that was realistic. It was about life. It was people. It was observant about the human condition. So you know, you're not in that arena where you're tossing them out trying to create that, and suddenly you have that. And you know, and, the st and you know, the great jokes there are legends about. I mean, you, you know, I know about that joke and how it first happened. And it's been written about. I mean, it's analyzed. It's you know, the, 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 the you know, the. What, what, what was the, what, there? There are big last jokes that people always remember. And if you have a, if you have a joke to close a movie, it's, um, it's huge. Yeah. But a lot of the um, we were talking about you know a lot of the great character-driven comedies of the '70s were people who had come out of sitcoms, and there's a sort of an understanding of a joke and how it works and how hard it is to come up with one and what the role of a joke is, that it seems like that the half hour is, a, is great training for that. And yet yeah, they're and not movies, the same. Story is supposed to be king in movies. I mean, it, that, that is the theory, and I think it's, I think it's probably true 95% of the time. Um, but you still find that it's, you're looking for a joke when you need it in a certain spot, but it's a different kind of joke. Yeah, and but it's funny, it, it, you know, if you read, you know, like I, I've been reading, uh, rereading for the umpteenth time, Preston Sturgis and stuff like that, uh -huh. and 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 you love, and the rhythms are extraordinary. The comedy rhythms are extraordinary. The patter of it, the music of it, is so great. But you don't come across big jokes that explode. I mean, and, and this is, you know, and his comedies live forever. Right. Um, that's interesting. I hope this first thing I said that. <laughs> It's all interesting. Um, another great thing that you said that I, that I was really fascinated with is you haven't written something unless you've written a monologue. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of monologues in your own work and sort of, you know, what are the most memorable and why you think they're important. Um, I worked on a on a the first drama. I did a, actually did a drama on television, Lou Grant, which was a com. I guess he's still the only comedy character spun off as a drama. And um, and and we and in the room came a a, a a wild writer, a Hunter Thompson type writer named Leon Tkachin, who used to write these long monologues, and 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 I was in love with his passion for them. I mean, you know that that you know it doesn't mean anything unless it runs for a page and a half, and then and then the trick is to make people sit still for it, you know, to to do that. But I think whenever you when you know, I think monologues are, I, in other words, there's a big thing about screenwriting. I, I went to, after the first movie I, the first movie I directed, I went to a film festival in uh, Mill Valley. I swear to God this happened. And I'm on a panel of screenwriters, and uh, I'm a big Patty Chayefsky guy. I've grown up, you know, I think anybody who goes back and reads his stuff, it's like, you know, he's in the argument for anything you want to crown in, in American literature. And, um, and I, I and I and I was talking about him, and and the, the everybody else on the panel said that and I guess it was the time too, it must have been eighty four or something, that that screenwriting the minute you feel the presence of a writer, the screenwriter is doing something wrong, and then I brought up Patty Chayefsky to refute that, and they booed Patty Chayefsky, <laughs> you know, really? they, and I and I'm in a room on a summer day and they're booing Patty Chayefsky <laughs> and I'm up there, and I'm on and I'm on a screenwriting panel. And um, and I and and I and now you know one of the things I'm, I still feel that same way. I still think if you can if you can make a monologue, well you ha you wrote one of the great. I mean, my God, you wrote one of the great monologues of recent years, you know, uh, in Prada. And um, and I, 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 I still you know believe that's true. And and and, and I think in, in comedy films, you know, certainly there, I don't know that there's an Apatow picture without a monologue. Now they've just come back. And I think when you call attention to the writing, it's what you're, I mean, my God, what if, I, I just believe in that. I don't, I don't think being caught up in the fact that the words are good is a bad thing when it comes to a movie. And do you feel like if a character can't, can't earn a monologue, that there's something wrong with the character? <sighs> no. <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I, th I, th I, I, you know, I, I think this, this, the, it's hard to have the story produce a moment where a monologue is appropriate and, 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 and it means something. And you can't do it too I think that's what's tricky more than, I think any character can talk for a page about his or herself.
But to do it without, with, while you're still maintaining with the momentum that of the story. There's storytelling in it, yeah. Um, another writer that you mentioned um, in, in one of the interviews that I looked at was F. Scott Fitzgerald, and that he was an important influence. What, can you talk about that a little bit? And um, you know, the fact that you can you know, drink and ruin your life <laughs> and still have a pretty good reputation, I think, is an inspiration <laughs> to us all. <laughs> No. <laughs> but was there something about he, the... He, the I, it, you know, was that... First of all, it was the age of great American novels and stuff like that, and he was so romantic, and, and, um, and, and his short stories were wonderful, and he was very specific. And he, is, he certainly is one of the writers where if he hadn't lived, there wouldn't be that kind of literature. It was only him who saw the world that way, who did the world that way who had those ambitions, who was able to be that honest, honest about himself. And the stories of that beautiful novelist and what happened to him in Hollywood is, you know, is just sort of stunning. And it's a uniquely Umer American... I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, yes. if I may. Please. Uh, uh, there, do you know who Joe Mankiewicz is? He did All About Eve, wonderful writer and stuff like that. Very successful producer. And uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald worked for him. And there's a book about screenwriting that I picked up. And it had this great thing because F. Scott Fitzgerald had his heart broken regularly by, by trying to write screenplays in Hollywood. And, um, and Mankiewicz called him in and Mankiewicz hated the scene he did and for this one thing and rewrote him. And this book has two pages, the scene that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote and the scene that Mankiewicz wrote, rewriting him. And you know, I don't, I don't think the, the, what I'm going to say is going to surprise you. They were each good scenes. You know? And one person was on this side of the desk and had the scene he wanted, and the other person who had written a good scene was on that side of the desk and got devastated. You know, it's just... Wow. But he also had a very I'm, I'm uniquely... A <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also he had a very uniquely American point of view. I mean, he was, he was writing American stories that were really about, you know, what it was who? like. Uh, Fitzgerald. And um, so it was just interesting that, that you, one of the artists that you cite is not a, not a filmmaker, but a... A, uh, and you said you'd, you'd written some short stories when you started. Did yeah. you did you th did you consider having a career in just prose writing, or did you always feel drawn to show business? I didn't because I, I, didn't I sent <laughs> out short stories that that. Uh, Do you still have them? No, I, I <laughs> no. Were they Fitzgerald uh, influenced? No, no, <laughs> no. I think P.G. Woodhouse would be closer <laughs> than. <laughs> writing humorous. And did you did you were you what what attracted you to show business? I mean, what attracted you to. Because you were working in the, you started out working in the news de news department at CBS. I always, you know, I love theater. I always loved playwriting. I always read plays. I read plays from as long as I could remember, and I, it was never something I imagined that I could make a living at. It was just that simple. Uh, but I, but I loved it so much that I take writing workshops and I take the, you know, without, th you know, never, but never with any ambition or that it would lead someplace. But I got to be around it a little bit. Did you ever seriously consider news as your? Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, the, the big surprise to me in my life is that, you know, because of what my life was and how hard it was to get a good job, that when I had a good union job, I left it and took the chance of coming here. I still am a sort of amazed that I was able to do that because it was really a job with a, it was a solid union job. And you had opportunities there in the, in the news department? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was like a life. Let me ask you this. Uh, uh <laughs> What are, are character names important to you? Is that something you spend a long time on? Is that, does that, does a character name ever help you find a character or write a character? Um, I always have a hard time with names. I, you know, I try not to make too big a deal out of it. But, you know, I try to, if it means something to me, it keeps me going. And some, sometimes I can't even do that. Do you, you mean sometimes you spend a lot of time I mean just Mary, trying to name I mean, we're, we're somebody who named Mary <laughs> Richards, you know, it's after Mary Tyler Moore, so, it was, right. so it's not something we labored over. It was <laughs> <laughs> but in, in some of your other, I mean, in Taxi, they all, you know, they, they have very specific names which really evoke the character in a way, you know, especially you were evoking a really broad range of characters in that show. Uh, I, you know, I don't think of it. I mean, it was it was Bobby and Andy, and you know, <laughs> it was like it was Louis. It, it, you know, but Louis, you know, Louis. DePaul Louis was it's a it very was specific. I, it it, it evokes. I, I don't think Louis would be a great name unless Andy DeVito walked out of that <laughs> cage. <laughs> um, can you tell the story about about um, the research that you did for Taxi and oh and man, and where Louis came from? Yeah, we we um, you know. We went to New York because the, the, the taxi series was based on a New York cab company 
that, that we had learned about from an article in New York Magazine. It was a, we, basically the series was based on this short article about a taxi company where all the drivers had ambitions to be something else. And we went to research that cab company and we got, and it was, I'll just never have as great a re -day, re research day in my life because we were there for 24 hours. I mean, we, we, we watched a ship go out and a ship go in and we stayed there and we were bleary eyed in the, in the morning and there were, and at one point we saw the dispatcher, the cab driver, try and hand $2 to the dispatcher to get a cab in good shape and the dispatcher waved it away because we were looking and that was Louie and that we, without that there wouldn't have been Louie, we wouldn't have thought of it, just that one thing, that was Louie. And then we wondered how to make a cab driver a hero in this story, the, you know, the, the Judd Hirsch character. And at the end of the shift, we went out with a group of cab drivers and uh, they were all talking about, as they did in the article, I want to be this, I want to be this. And the one guy that they were waiting for, sort of a charismatic young guy, said, me, I'm a cab driver. And that was, you know, the thing that, that, that made Alex a hero to us. That he was content. Accepted who he was, accepted, accepted who he what was. he was. And um, I know research is something that's very important to you. Was that something that you always um, had stressed, or was that something that you, as it evolved? Gene Reynolds, uh, Gene Reynolds, uh, you know, just a great, thanks, a great uh, director and producer, the guy who did MASH uh, and who hired me for my first show, which was Room 222. He was the one who just made me do research, you know, because it was about a high school, and he kept on sending me back to the high school. I can't tell you how much. I mean, I, months and months I spent at that high school. And then, and then I became a research addict as a result. And so on every, on how much research do you do? Is it a couple of months or could it be a year or? Could be a year, easy. I mean, usually is, yeah. And do you know what Never quite stops, too. Do you know what your story is or what your character is Sometimes it comes from it. I mean, broadcast news came from research, yeah. From, you just were interested in I hung around the conventions at that time and I met, you know, one girl told me a story about the two guys she was going out with and somebody else told me this story and it all sort of got together, yeah. Uh, and then sometimes you do it the other way, like for Spanglish, did you do research Spanglish, on I spent a ton of time, um, you know, interviewing Hispanics and doing, and doing whole rooms filled and, you know, and having and translators and, you know, really literally hundreds of pages of, you know, just to begin to have the conceit, conceit that you can write about, you know, just, uh, you know, when, you, when you're not Hispanic, to write about Hispanics, just begin to believe you have, you know, it's not just crazy for you to do that job. And, uh, you know, when I did As Good As It Gets, I, I you know, and I, and I had a gay character, and I knew I had a central gay character, and I've had gay friends all my life, and, and uh, but I started to talk to, I started to interview gay friends to the point where they wanted to kill me because <laughs> of the kinds of questions I, w I was asking, because I felt I had to do one step further, I had to know that much more. And, and for I'll Do Anything, which was sort of Hollywood-based, was I there anything? No <laughs> research needed. <laughs> <laughs> that was all, all yeah, stuff yeah, that you had yeah, experienced. Yeah. Um, what, are your, what are your goals when, you're, when you sit down to write a script for the first 10 pages? Is there something specific that you want to accomplish? Are you, how do you know when you've got the right setup? Well, I was sort of fascinated by that thing that they're going to have a first deal 20 about pages, ho yeah. hook 20 I'm pages. Actually I think I'm on one of those, so I want you to tell me what I should but say. You know, the, the thing I've always, I, first of all, I've always heard 30. I mean, you know, Sid Field says First 30. I, I think it's pretty heretical to come up here and say 20. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but then there's this, there's, there's this big argument about you're packed with the audience, which I believe in. You know, that, like, and then there's an argument about how many pages you could be a little dull, but they'll stay with you in the hope that you're starting a story. There are all those arguments about the amounts of pages before that happens. But I think the big deal at the beginning of a, of a screenplay is somehow you make your pact with the audience. You tell them whether you're going to be telling a story that they know how it's going to turn out and the fun is going to be watching you get to a point everybody could foresee, or whether you're going to be giving them surprises and, and that they shouldn't count on it being a certain way. They should be open, which I favor, but which they should be open to the developments as they occur. And what do you build into the first 10 pages to do that? You, do you upend some expectations on purpose? You know, I, I, it's not like, like if you ask me the first 10 pages of it, you know, I, I think in terms of endearment, it was very important for me to open up with that baby and stuff like that. That's I think amazing. it set the tone of it. I think, you know, it's the, the, the crib death, the crib scene. death. I think, I think it was very important. <laughs> I always had it. First thing I wrote, never was going to change it. You know, it was always, it was always a deal. 
And um, broadcast news, I think it was just. Did you always start with the prologues? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I'd throw them out. I thought I'd write them as kids, so I understood them myself. And then I really like, I really like starting the movie that way. And and I, I guess that's my favorite beginning of a movie. And and that's certainly not a book, <laughs> you know. It's right. except that it's going to be about three people. And what do you? I mean, writers often talk about setting up things, setting up a character, setting up. How much do you think you can set up before your actual story is, is on the run? Or is it, is it, do you think about, I, sh I should start my story and sort of set up the characters as the story is already unfolding? I don't know that I, you know, if I'm not adapting, you know, I think I've done that twice, I don't know that I know my story. I mean, I have an outline, I know I can stray from it. God help me in this instance, I didn't even have an outline of what I'm working on now. Uh, so I, I don't know that I, I know my story that much. I know highlights of it. I know where I, you know, I sort of know how I want it to end up. I sort of have some intention of why I'm sitting there. But I, you know, and I, and I don't recommend, I think it's great when you have an outline and don't treat it like the Bible. I think that's the best way to work. When you say you know how you want it to end up, do you know story-wise or sort of thematic or character-wise? See, I had, I, you know, broadcast news was really sort of a, a weird thing to happen because I, it, that's where ignorance is bliss, you know, because, because I, I, I think it was my, you know, it was my first original, actually, my first original screenplay. Second, I won for television. But, um, but what I said to myself is the way to do a triangle is that you don't commit to which guy she goes to. And you could and have written you, it. And that you film it chronologically and that the actors know that you haven't decided and that it's open and no scene has to have an exact result to make the audience root for this guy or that guy. And it was a great way to work. And then I couldn't resolve it. I couldn't put it with either guy. I tried. I couldn't do it. And I ended the movie that way. And it was so weird that I got away with doing that. And it was so, it was so, I mean, it was so creative. It was so pure to have done that. And I had such a support you, from you the actors. You intentionally said, we're going we're gonna to do this as if you're both equally viable options. Yeah, they all I could, that. I yeah, could they write it yeah. with either end. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever think? I try to do it. I filmed you try, one. You yeah, I oh, filmed, filmed one. You I filmed did. one because it, because it was so crazy to end a movie like that. So I went. And I went to Can the you tell us who, who she ended up with? Well, I went to, and I, 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 here was the thing. I, I said, I had heard, somebody told me a story, it might be a lie, that, that for a man and a woman, the, they, they has this wildly romantic thing. She, they see each other at the train station, and that the director had not told the actors that they, they would see each other at the train station, and that's what they filmed. So I said, oh, man, I'm going to cheat wow. and copy that. And I, and I, um, I said it was a reshoot for uh, the scene, if you remember, Holly Hunter gets in a car driving away alone at the end, and at the, and at the last minute I was going to put Bill Hurt in the car knowing that these actors were so good they'd improvise something, and, and, and without ever having had to think about it, I'd have a great ending or something like that. So, um, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and, it was, and it was, and it was very tense. I mean, the idea of 150 people holding a secret and trying to get the actor and trying to do all that. It was a whole amazing tension built up through the course of the day. And just before Bill stepped in the cab, somebody gave it away. And, and I, went, I went crazy. I went out of body. I, I don't know what I did for 10 minutes. I, I, was, I was frothing and I was, you know, and, and, and then, and, you know, they couldn't reach me. Well, we, we have to film it. Why don't we just film it now even though we know the actor's coming over, Jim, we really should, you know, because I was so... Oh. And we and we filmed something and we did it and and the actors liked it and it, but it was, you know. And you think if they hadn't, uh, uh, something would have <laughs> happened. It would have been it would have been an authentic. It would have been authentic. It would something would have happened. I don't know whether it would have been the end of a movie, but it would have been two very talented people dealing with beautifully with a with, with a, a with, with a with a creative challenge. Wow, that's yeah. a great that's a great story for <laughs> fans of that movie. That's a great story. Um, and that leads me pretty naturally. You have written so many, so many memorable and award-winning roles for women, which is really, um, you know, somewhat unique coming from a man. Is that something that you are conscious of? Do women interest you in a different way from men? <laughs> I almost did a spit take. I almost <laughs> did a spit take. It would have been so... I'm sorry I didn't. <laughs> that would have been...
have been good, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah Apart from interest, the obvious but. ways. <laughs> I, you Psychologically. Know, I, I was Psychologically, well, I was raised by, uh, by an older sister and a mother, and, and my, my mother had two sisters, and I think, so just think that was my environment. You know. And so you, f you, you feel like you naturally gravitate to the psychology of a, did you ever look up and say, wow, I'm really writing a lot of female lead, or, or it never occurred to you? I mean, people say what you're saying, so, but, but it's, it's uh, you know, I, you know, I know, I know I'm trying to do it now, that I get a notion about, you know, that we've seen the same heroin for a while and I try and figure out a new heroin, you know, what, what you know, and I, and you know, that was very much about the research that I did for broadcast news and, and my really, my, my main thrust was that I wanted to present a different kind of woman. Everything was sort of post-feminism at that time and I wanted to get a different kind of girl. And, um, and you know, the, the, the great example, the great, I think, I think if you have to say the most original heroine ever written, I think you'd have to go to Network because I remember seeing Network in a theater and seeing, and seeing that character seem farcical to me. I mean, it was like, I mean, I remember leaving and I'm a big Chayefsky fan and I was saying, you know, there's no woman like that and, you know, and two seconds later it was like it was everywhere hummingbirds. In the culture. It was, yes, yes, <laughs> everywhere. It was amazingly prescient. Um, that's that's also, in terms of, um, I, I know at some point I've heard you talk about what makes a hero, and that the lead of your of your movie really has to be a hero. What what is a hero to you or a heroine? I don't know. I'm having you know I'm having a hard time now. But I think I think at a certain point you have to define what makes your hero a hero, you know. And I remember, um, I, I you know I can in terms of endearment. I just said to myself one day, mom is always right. You know, it might not be pretty, but mom is always right in this movie. And there's something heroic about being always right. And then her daughter, you know, in terms of endearment, where I figured it out, was the most forgiving person. You know, having endured that mother, she was automatically forgiving. She didn't judge people. And I still, I still love that character for that reason, the least judgmental person I've ever seen, you know, just, it just wasn't in her. That's Mary Richards' quality as well, isn't it? Um, well, that, Mary, Mary Richards was more Protestant ethic, the way you conduct yourself in interaction with other human beings, you know. It's, it's more like good posture with her. <laughs> but the, the idea of, of one being, really having the moral, being, being right, even if she, her behavior wasn't, wasn't that, that was enough to make her a hero for you. I mean, that was, that forgave all her other sort of I think she I think Mary Richards had great innate dignity, I think. You but know. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, in terms of endearment, the mother character. Even though she had obviously some external flaws, the fact that she was right, as you were saying, that she, yes. that she ultimately knew the way to go, allowed you to write her in a more, make more mistakes, right? Or, well, or, be, or be more, of, more outlandish. It, it allowed me my affection for her at a, at a certain point in the writing. And that's, Im is that important for you to feel like I these are? Yeah, I think it sure helps, yeah. If you feel an affection for the characters yeah. and, an, and for a lead character maybe an admiration for the character. Yeah, and, and I had a thing happen, it's one of the things, you know, that in research, I, you know, it's, it's such a neat way to work if you can because I'd be all screwed up on that character and I'd go back down to Texas and, I, and I'd know my mission was just and I and you and I remember one telling day where I I, I was you know pretty young and and uh, and and there were these um, advanced middle-aged women who I'd be interviewing, and then at five o'clock when it would become time for drinks and you know and it started to get dark at five thirty, and you realize that after you left they were alone in that house, and if you didn't sit there and feel it and feel the change in what night brings to them, you could never I don't think you could write her I mean I you. you and I don't know where in the writing that is, except I still think that was an important thing to be there yeah, for. Yeah. How long do you take? <laughs> I'm not good <laughs> on at average that. Uh, to do what? To write a script, including the research. Um, <laughs> I, longest to shortest. I, shortest you know, something. The, the, the truth is that I couldn't be sitting here if I knew. You know, if I, and that's the truth. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I think 
Jul is Julie here? And, and sometimes I ask her, because um, uh, we've worked together forever, and, and, and sometimes I ask her how long did I take on that script, and she'll say, which I have now blocked and forgotten <laughs> how many years it's been, and, and, and I'll go, oh, really? And, you know, that it's, it's... Um, Do you procrastinate? Um, I mean, do you procrastinate? In you know, the, it's so weird because I come from television, and, and you know, and I still work on The Simpsons, and I work very quickly. And, and but we didn't work quickly on The Simpsons movie. That was the same thing I'm talking about. That that script, you'd go nuts if I told you how long that took us. <laughs> and, but do you do, do you when you sit down? Do you sit down? Do you write at a computer? Do you write longhand? Do you computer. write? You write a computer. Do you? Is there any eBay, or is it just you sit down and you go? There's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, uh, there, there, there's, um, there's poker. Oh, poker! <laughs> yes. Okay, good. I knew there was some. Yeah. I knew it wouldn't be mine. Yes, it wouldn't yes. be Blue Fly. Um, do you have any? Um, do you have a schedule that you follow? Do you like to be at the desk at a certain time and like to leave I at a certain <laughs> time? <laughs> <laughs> this is people want to know. You're bent on humiliating me, aren't you? You're just <laughs> people want to know. <laughs> um, in, it, it's rarely that I work at night, but I but I do find myself going there at night to to write down a specific idea. That that happens to me. Um, I think it's good to be there first thing in the morning, and um, and I and I like the mornings. I like the mornings. That's usually my my most, most productive. productive time. Do you have any superstitions or any habits? Um, like, do you like to have, you know, a certain cup of mug of coffee, or do you have it like <laughs> to have things configured a certain way? <laughs> this is this is the pitfalls <laughs> of having a writer interview you. <laughs> I want to know the nitty gritty. Um, no, I don't think I have anything like that. I, you know, I have to have coffee and stuff like that, but I don't. So that's just okay. Um, now, did did um, having the other having the experience of directing your own work, do you think it changed the way you write or the process of your writing? Do you look at your writing in a different way? I wish it had more to tell you. I mean, I, 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 think, I, sh I think there's something wrong with me that it hasn't affected that more. I, and I mean that, you know, really seriously. And, um, but, you know, the one thing you can do when you direct your own work is that the thing that the writer thought about gets a shot. Everything the writer thought about gets a shot. You know, and at a certain point it doesn't work and you have to change it and it's a, and it's, and it, and it, and it's a big transition. And, but then, there, you know, it's, it, uh, you know I, I shouldn't say it just like that because then I remember the, the idea that it takes, it's so hard to get a movie made and that suddenly you're sitting in a trailer and you, and, and you go in there and you, and you do two pages, which I've done, and you come out and it's in a movie after all that time of trying, after years of trying to get a movie made. So that's sort of great too. So, you know, what you have to do is, is, is remember you're a lucky stiff, you know. But one of the things, you know, ha when you've worked in half hour, you're accustomed to rewriting things very quickly on the fly. And so for a feature writer to be able to rewrite quickly on the fly, you know, after how many ever many years it's taken you to get to the set, but you can you have that skill to rewrite quickly on the fly. Do you think that's that's something? Because not every writer can rewrite themselves so quickly and have any distance on it, be able to judge whether what they came in. Well, with do you is think? Better. I mean, because you've had both experiences. I I I I don't I can't. It's hard to think of a movie script where if you put it in a good room, that the script won't get better quicker. Quick. Quick, quick, it would get better. Don't you think so? I mean, it's just... Not if it's not, not if the story's not locked in. That's true. It's, uh, once the story's That's locked true. in, then you can embroider. That's but true. But it would get sharper and it would be, you know... So you find things in the set, in, in rehearsal, that you go back to refine the writing? Yeah, and or you, when you're directing, you know, you, you know, it's called directing. You can change it. And you, you, you're not <laughs> writing it down, but you're saying this and, you know... Right. So you're calling it directing. And do then. you do sort of what you do on the floor of a half hour? Like you call out lines, you think of, of alternatives? I, I, I call you out know, I, it takes a while for actors to get used to this thing because, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, and, I, and, I, and I produce other writer directors and, and, uh, and I see that all of them wait for the take to finish and then go in and give notes. But I think it's my television muscles where I, can't wait till the end of the scene when I think it's going along. I can't, so I interrupt, and, and that becomes basically part of the dynamic. You, you know? interrupt during the scene. You'll stop yeah. the scene, or you'll talk to them during I, the I, scene. I, 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 both. 
That's fascinating. And what about the other thing in, in television, the ends of scenes and the ends of acts, very specific. Do you, when you're writing movie scenes, do you feel like you need to have that out, that need to have that, that line that really seals it up? Not as much. Not as much. I mean, it, you know, but it's still, I mean, it's important, but it's not like you've got to have a blackout. Right. I mean, you know, it's... Um, you said that anything can kill a scene, anything. And <laughs> the instance that you cited was Burt Reynolds' trench coat. Oh my, coat. don't start me. <laughs> His trench coat. You see the incredible and starting Hulk, over. <laughs> and I went and watched the clip. Is it the clip where she sings? Don't you agree? Don't you agree? It's, it's, it's startling because she's wearing a very light sheer blouse and he's wearing a shirt, a jacket, and a trench coat. That trench coat. Don't you agree? <laughs> but you think that's what... That's great that you saw that. Do you yeah. agree seeing the trench coat? The that the room I don't seen? know if I would have thought of it without <laughs> it, but I did think it's a, she's trying to seduce him and he's got an awful lot of clothing on. Um, but she pounds on him, and it's like he's wearing a shield, <laughs> that, that coat. Yeah. H and it's brand new, too. It's brand new. It has, you know, and it looks brand new, yeah. yeah. How do you know, how do you tell when a detail is killing a scene? And how do you, is that, some, is that, is that part of the, your impulse to direct, to be able to head well, off the, the trench coats at the pass? Well, the, 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 great, the great thing about directing is, is, is that, you know, when, when, when you really feel bad, when you, the paranoia you have that something like that kills a scene. And I don't know that it's paranoia. I mean, you know, it's such a hard argument to have. I, I, I believe an audience notices everything every moment. I think that's true. I think that's absolute fact. So I don't think it's paranoia. I think so. And you know, so I've had things where a detail has driven me crazy, and I went back and corrected the detail. Doesn't happen that often. Wow, that's amazing. Um, okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, one of the things that you, oh gosh, yeah, one of the things that you said you referred to yourself as having salesman blood from your family, and. Um, do you, do you find as a producer and a director you have to sort of balance your salesman role with your writing role, which is a little bit more artistic, let's say? Could you? I mean, as a, do you feel like you, you have a responsibility to make your work commercial or make your work accessible to people as a... Well, yeah, you have a responsibility to make money for the people who hire you. And, you know, when you don't fulfill that responsibility, there are, you know, <laughs> pretty direct penalties and... and uh, <laughs> And you know, and, th and that's a simple. But do you find that ever in conflict with what you're trying to do? Well, the thing, you know, I, you know, Howard Hawks said the most disturbing thing. I, I even don't want to repeat it. It's like I'm putting a curse on you that you're going to have this quote in your head for the rest of your lives because it's. <laughs> but you know, but but in, in in misery loving company, I'll tell you something Howard Hawks said that 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 haunts me, and I particularly apologize to you for putting this in your <laughs> in your mind. Uh, but he said. He did a number of wonderful movies, and he said the ones that he did for passion and the ones that he did for money, the batting average on quality was about the same, which is horrific. You know, right. it's just you know. But I I went and I watched the trailers for Terms of Endearment and Broadcast News, and what's interesting is they seem to try and sell Terms as a comedy and Broadcast News as a drama, and um, I'm interested in sort of the. The Jim Brooks movie, the James Brooks movie, is is sort of a genre un unto itself in a way, and the blending of comedy and drama is something that people find incredibly difficult to do. And is that something that you are conscious of? Well, broadcast news, I think it was murder. The trailer was murder. I think this frequently happens. But in terms of endearment, the only thing that kept me going was that I wanted it to be a comedy. When when it was when the, the Golden Globes has two categories yeah. and I, and, and they had to almost hose me down because I was furious they were putting me in the dramatic category because I, you know, and I said, you know, you need, you need to clock so many audience laughs. You come into a theater, you, that's your job because the thing that distinguished it to me is that it was a comedy. I mean, it would not be a distinguished movie or have a chance at being one. It, it, then it would just be about a girl dying. You know, what's that? But a realistic comedy about you know the life of a girl who dies is something else, and uh, so th are they comedies with drama or dramas with comedy, or they depend? De uh, depends. It depends. Depends. Do you think of yourself as having your own sort of way of blending that that is unique to you, or you know sometimes I get worried because I'll go a certain point and I and I you know you know what's going on now that I that I better do something funny and and it's very often happens to me that's that you know in 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 um, in as good as it gets there's a hospital room scene 
where Greg Kinnear is pretty smashed up from, if you saw yeah, it, that, you know, that beaten. It, that, you know yes. beaten and scarred. And that was a dramatic scene. And the day I went there to direct it, I said, I, let's make it a comedy scene. And, that, and that's exciting when you do that, that you just make the choice, that you change form for that scene that day. What do you think of the term dramedy? Hate it. <laughs> I thought you might. Why? Yeah. It's a loathsome term. It's but you don't, you don't categorize them in your mind as one or the other. You do. You did terms, you took a dramatic material, and you wanted to do comedic specifically. It's the way it occurred to me. It's not like, like some callous judgment. It's the way that... That seemed to, s it seemed to take that form. Yeah. And would you say As Good As It Gets was a comedy or a drama? I'd s say it was a comedy. Would you say they're all, all the films are? Yes. You would. <laughs> to you they are. <laughs> Good. That's the answer I was looking for. With elements of drama. With uh, hopefully lifelike. Hopefully, you know, comedy that understands that life is painful very often and that people go through re really tough times. I think you said at some point you refer to it as comedy with people in it or something like that. I, I, I don't know. Um, now you're, you're just, we'll, we'll just ask you one more question then we can open it up to questions. But um, your record as a producer on work you didn't write is, is, in, is really impressive and I'm sure most people know what they are but it's, it includes Big, War of the Roses, Say Anything, Jerry Maguire, Bottle Rocket. Um, and what do you look for in the projects that you produce? Is it stuff that you wish you'd written or could never write? Uh, stuff with a distinctive writer, the, the, something with a writer with a real voice is sort of the common ground. That's what that's, you know you always look for. That it's really you really feel there's a writer there. I think that's always nice if you're look if you can afford to look for that. And do you feel is that process less painful for you than than do you feel a certain detachment from the? Well, work? because then it's great because then you're just trying to help out somebody you really believe in instead of trying to impose your thing on somebody. You you just sort of get their thing and you're trying to support it. And are those generally projects where you've done a lot of drafts with people? Oh, um, uh, you know, enormous. Yeah, I mean, there's a, that seems to ha that seems to be in common. You know, the, 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 it, yeah. In your own, that's something you do in your own work, and also when you when you I produce things. <laughs> I mostly drive other people to do a, <laughs> a lot of drafts. But and are the drafts big big steps, big changes? Big, big, big. big you big. take you correct course. Jerry to see. McGuire it, it had, I mean, I think Jerry McGuire is the record in my knowledge of number of real drafts, you know, and I think it's in triple digits. I know, isn't that? Of going it's back It's always good to get a gasp. It feels, <laughs> why does that feel better than anything, getting a gasp? <laughs> of going back and saying, I think you should try this, or maybe you it should. It was just, just the process, process of it. It was just the process of it, and God, it's a great film. And it's God, a he did a, a great job. And, and, and Cameron does that anyway. Cameron, you'll talk 10 minutes, and the next thing you know, there's another, dr I mean, he's, he does that. He's able to do that. Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you for coming, Mr. Brooks. Really appreciate it. Um, one of my favorites has always been broadcast news, and I was just wondering, since that movie was made, given the rather dramatic decline in journalistic standards since then, um, do you think it would be harder to do nowadays, or would your approach be different? Or? It, you know, I don't think it would be appropriate now. I think w that was about a tug of war between an old and new that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, it's just we transcended to something else. But you know, but it was sort of amazing that with that, as with the consideration of journalistic standards, every place lowering to such an extraordinary extent, particularly in television, that when Tim Russert died, suddenly you found, you know, there was the Bible glistening again as people talked about those values and as you heard about him and you heard about the bureau that he took. So maybe, you know, maybe there's just something, there's just an assumption that, that, that it's dead. Maybe, there, maybe the heart beats true, which is great because I, certainly in, in the way NBC treated his death and the way his colleagues came together to talk about his death, it was about, you know, all the fine standards that, you know, that, that, that we care about. Uh, thank you for coming. I don't have to tell you The Simpsons has been running for a long time. Over here. <laughs> I don't have to tell you The Simpsons has been running for a long time. What's been the hardest part of keeping the quality up and the consistency of the program? You know, th I think, th I think that for some reason, I, you know, this, this isn't going to make sense, but it's the truth that we went through a whole period of time, oh my God, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that, and it was like you, like you read about marathons, that you get past the 10-mile barrier and suddenly there's something that happens. 
and we don't have those conversations. I have no understanding why. We've discussed it at the table. Nobody has any explanation of it. But it was getting impossibly hard where we thought we'd have to bring the show down. And then suddenly there was this great second win. And then I think the movie gave us another win. Hi, Mr. Brooks. Um, I wanted to ask you as a writer, director, what um, insight you can give to writers who want to direct about the pre-production process. Is there anything that a writer you could specifically say, this is what you need to prepare for that you probably wouldn't guess as a writer? In pre-production? Yes. Uh, to prepare for your production. How, how much comes at you so fast? How, how hard it is to care in the way you're used to caring when there's a line of people waiting to see you to make choices that have to be made at that moment. So that you, so you have to do it with, with much, much less preparation. I mean, and, and, then, and then my advice would be to take time with casting. Hi. Hi. <laughs> right here. I'm sorry, I'm not standing up. I can't find anybody. Sorry. Um, I, I, I just wanted to say I, I find your writing very Chekhovian. And, um, and in that vein, I'm curious if you've ever uh, written a play or, ha or do you have any aspirations to write a play? And number two, I'm just curious what's harder for you personally writing television or writing a feature? Uh, feature is, you know, just harder, I think. Just, just you know, the, the storytelling requirements and, you know, uh, you know I, think th I think that's harder. But I, I also want to say that it seems like almost all great dramas on television right now. So you, so, you, so you know that has to be noted. And what was the other part of the question? Oh, yeah. um, I, 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 when I was first starting out, I had, I had, I had plays that I, you know, I wrote bits of plays, never a whole play. I directed a play once. Hi, I need your help. <laughs> I've got a screenplay with nine characters, bicultural, bisexual, bi-coastal. <laughs> <laughs> and they all have passion, and, and I have passion for them. And my friends who are comedy writers have all said, you've got to lose at least one of them. And I don't know whose head to chop off. I, I don't want to cut anybody. I, I um, feel passionate about all of them. And I need to know sort of. It's a comedy? <laughs> yes, with people in it. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of them. <laughs> And they go on and on for 120 pages. And everyone says, oh, God, if you don't get that down to 109, no one's going to read it. And, and you have nine? Nine. And you're being told to have eight? Or seven, <laughs> or, you know. OK, well, I say 10. <laughs> <laughs> Will you read it? <laughs> I, I mean, I think, it's, I, I think that that's the wrong way to go about it. That, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I, it may, I, if, if you cut, you cut for story. If you cut, you cut for clarity of story. That's, that's, that should be the guiding you know, the guide point, not how many characters you have. Yeah, because it's going whiz-bang at the end of every scene, and then it goes on again. And so, like, there is a bit of redundancy. I, the, the big, the, you know, usually the rough lesson is story, story, story. Question. Uh, um, mm? Okay, three, th what's the book where, y where the, the Mankiewicz and the Fitzgerald thing, and I really want to read this book. I think it was Screenwriters 19, something to 1950-something. That'll be easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was amazed I came that close. Oh, okay. <laughs> no idea who wrote it. Okay. Um, what, who is out there that delights you, that you know, maybe that you've not been involved with, but that make you laugh? And then there seems to be a crisis in the second act when you're, you know, you're writing, particularly if you're writing like you do, which amazes me without an outline or a, a uh, whiffery uh, outline. Uh, yeah, you know, so that crisis in the middle act do you know, maybe you don't experience it that way. How do you deal with we, that? Um, no, it, I, I experience crisis in various acts. It's when your crisis in the third act is the most serious, I, I think. And, and uh, the second act, you can, th the second act in the Simpsons movie it bedeviled us. And we always had the opening act that worked. And the second act, I mean, not that you could tell from seeing the movie, but in truth, and we spent, again, and you know, the truth is, is rough here, you know, how long we spent writing that script. But the second act consumed, I'd say, easily 80% of our time. I just want to ask you, I'm sorry. Um, there was one question that Jay, Jay Kogan sent me some questions. And one of them was, um, what is it that you love right now? What do you, what do you, what's high on your TiVo list? What movies are you rushing out to see? Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Batman. 
and and um, and I think The Office is one of the extraordinary achievements. I just I just love that show. Uh, Mr. Brooks, all of the sitcoms you've worked on have just such an amazing ensemble of well-balanced, interesting characters that we want to see again and again. When you're creating the pilot, how do you dissociate between a character that's going to really have legs and a character who might be funny in one episode? Um, usually it works the other way around. Usually you, you have a character come into one. It's happened to me so many times that we had a character for one episode that was so good that they became a regular. That's happened to me four or five times. And uh, the, 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 the one thing, the crazy thing we did, we did a pilot once um, called The Associates. It was a series that it ran for 13 episodes. And Marty Short's first series. And, uh, and I thought it would be the greatest thing for the, st for the purpose of the story, we actually did this, that it all be about whether the good guy or the bad guy would be fired at the end as the series went forward. And, I, and everybody knows you're going to fire the bad guy because the good guy is going to be the star of the series. And I said, how cool it will be to fire the good guy. <laughs> and I think I crippled the series when we did it. But it really made for a wonderful episode, I think. <laughs> <but> <laughs> uh, Mr. Brooks, um, back here. Uh, I uh, uh, was looking at the Mary Tyler Moore um, uh, first season, and I was shocked in the special materials that CBS didn't believe in the show. And uh, I wondered if you would talk about that for a minute, that they didn't even like the episode that won the Emmy that year. And I, 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 it just blew me away. So I just wondered if you had anything to say about that. Yeah, I, 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 you know, the, uh, Alan Burns comes up a second time. First of all, we, we, CBS didn't like it, wanted to fire us. We, we, we had a bad idea with the first thing we pitched, and they wanted to fire us. And instead, we got a chance to do another idea, which was the show, and we had you know, I, I think anybody who ever worked for him would say the greatest boss they ever had, Grant Tinker, who actually fought for the writers, fought for the creator. I mean, it's just <coughs> strange how great he was. And, um, and uh, they, they, Alan Burns, I walked into the office one day, and we had done a show with a uh, character called Rhoda. Her mother uh, was on the show, and, uh, and he was on the phone with the network executive, and uh, who we had had a who had come to a party for the show the night before. And, you know, and he was telling, he was really blasting the story outlining and telling us not to make it. And Alan just, it was one of the, it had to be one of the greatest moments in his life. He says, he, and he said, and he, and he said, I think you're wrong about that. And by the way, you were rude to my wife last night. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mr. Brooks. First of all, thanks for all your years of great work. It's had a big impact on me. Um, I'm wondering, when you made the transition to, to film, did you find, because of your prior success in television, did that afford you any creative you know, leeway or latitude more than oh you God otherwise yes. would have had? I, I think I, 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 I'm at least unusual in having final cut on the first picture I directed for a studio. And it's because I, I, of, m of the fact that I was doing television at that time, and I was doing television for the same studio that was doing the movie. So God, yes, is the answer. <laughs> okay, um, Mr. Brooks, um, how important when they made the Man in the Moon? How important were you involved in the process for making that film? And how important? Because I feel it was an homage to Taxi, but. How important did you feel that movie was to taxi the show and stuff? Um, I'm a big Milos Forman fan. He's a great guy. The happiest year of my life is when I had, was able to do a good impression of him. <laughs> because I, cause I, I cause I'd get so far into the impression, and I tend to do this alter ego thing where I go around with this character that I do all the time, and the character changes. And I was adorable when I did Milo Schwarman, because <laughs> he is adorable. And it's gone? So, it's, so gone? So it's gone? It's gone. I, I, and, and Julie knows I spent time trying to get it back because he's cuddly. Every woman loves him. It's just great. <laughs> and uh, it was great. <laughs> um, but I think on that movie, having said that, I think, I think nobody who did the movie appreciated that Taxi, and I believe this fervently, was a great television show. And that, with that, that it was, and it was, and it, I, I, I still think it was, you know, one of the proudest time of my life, best time of my life, you know, just, so they didn't, so what they thought, their fix was that Andy Kaufman 
was, was going downtown and betraying himself, when really in the Andy Kaufman lexicon, this is some of the greatest work he's done, and that we had a television series that was able to accommodate this very difficult but extraordinary and groundbreaking artist was a big deal, and I, and I don't think they got that essential truth. And, and so that movie bothered me for that reason. Mr. Brooks, um, you know, you're unique as a television creator in that you've uh, created hit shows in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, right up until today, you still have a show on the air, and you've kind of seen television over 35, 40 years. Right now, you know, everybody kind of agrees that there's kind of a lull when it comes to comedy. Comedy's dead, can't get a comedy on the air. Uh, your show is still going strong, of course, The Simpsons after 20 years. Do you agree with that? Do you feel that comedy's dead or because of what you've seen? I mean, how would you evaluate what's going on right now? It, it's a tough time for network comedy just according to arithmetic, how many comedy shows are on the air. And reality television show is definitely the enemy of comedy television. I mean, there's no other way to look at it. But I think, um, I th I think there's great comedy. I think I think Thirty Rock is terrific. I think The Office is terrific. Uh, I, you know, I'm not. Ab I, there's so much I can watch. I mean, I just you know, I there's cable shows that I'm that I'm religious to, but I you know, I watch The Daily Show as often as I can. I watch. There's a lot of comedy that I'm watching. I mean, you know, that I don't have the time to watch as much good comedy that's on, and uh, I spend a lot of time watching television. So I, I in 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 that respect, I I don't think there's a crisis in terms of control of comedy before a show's a hit, the, the, the network relationship with comedy writers, I think there have been better days. And um, you know, I think th those kinds of things are difficult. And I think one of the things that we treasure on The Simpsons is knowing that creative freedom is hard to come by these days on network television. And all of us, and we're a very large group, I think all of us treasure that. Some have gone outside, tried other things. You know, it's really lovely to be, to, to, govern, your own, to, to govern your own show. It's really, it's really great to have a show where, the, where, you're, where you're, you don't start out by going through a bunch of notes that didn't come from the writer's table. It's really a, it's really a privilege. And, but, but, you know, certainly Larry Charles has that, and uh, Larry David has that, and, uh, you know, in, in, in their show. And, um, you know, so so there's a lot of you know there's a lot of great comedy on television. Hi, um, you obviously pay attention to your casting, and um, do your actors ever take your words to a different direction than, or you know, just take it to another level? And do you also ever allow them to rewrite for you? <laughs> uh, you always, you know, like I say, the one thing you can do. If you're a writer director, is give the, what the writer wanted a chance. Once you've done the script, then I, I'm o open to any experimentation. And the thing you're dying for for everybody with casting and everything is free ones, is actors that can get you jokes where you never imagined it, actors who can get you laughs where you never imagined it. You know, you know. I mean, there's been times with Nicholson where he said something I didn't understand at the time, and an audience broke up. That's great. Hi, Mr. Brooks. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my question also has to do with casting. Um, and I'd like to ask a lot of questions, but specifically about um, the genius stroke of casting Holly Hunter in Broadcast News. Did you have trouble getting her in that film? <laughs> uh, it's not a genius stroke. It's, it's at a certain point, God trying to make up its mind, his mind, his or her mind, whether to touch me on the shoulder mm -hmm. and, and deciding to touch me on the shoulder. And uh, we, we were two days away from beginning rehearsal and there, w and I had nobody I loved for that part, but we were going to have to start shooting, and I had somebody who was good, and uh, and you know, and and this is I, I guess there's no story about my career that I tell more often than this. Um, Julia Taylor is a very noteworthy casting person, and she had listened to me whine for six months about this about this character and about what I wanted and not finding it, and any casting director that I know. Two days before rehearsal, when you finally found somebody that's good, hearing me go over it again would have just rolled her eyes and wonder when I'd get off the phone so she could go back to her life. And instead, she asked me more questions. This is after six months. And, I, and she got me to say it a different way. And she said, well, there's one girl that you haven't seen. And that was Holly Hunter. And she came in two days before. 
And can you, you need help. You need. I mean, and and the example is you need. You know, you're just so lucky when when somebody cares as much and maintains interest in this thing that you're obsessed with. Hi, my name is Carolyn, and I'm a writer. Um, feels like a meeting. Um, I love your work. Uh, as good as it gets is my favorite movie. I have probably quoted Jack Nicholson's uh, line, um, how do you write women so well? <laughs> Elevator door is closing. <laughs> you know the answer. Um, I hope that came from you. Um, but really, part of the reason that I love that movie is the mother, because I'm a single mother, and I connected with her so well, and I wanted to tell you that, especially with the date and she goes and checks on the kid, <laughs> and you know what happens. She comes back, and the man leaves. Yeah. I'm in Los Angeles now. I'm from Connecticut. I have a daughter, and I get it, and I think that is the greatest feeling for a writer. I wanted to share that with you. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. And the Sid Field thing, do you hit the 17 page and the 85 page still? Do you still follow him? Is it, isn't this isn't 30, 60, and then he came up that, that 90 is important, isn't it? There's 15, there's <laughs> inciting 15 incident, is, yeah, there's slow point, there's 1530, 60, low point, right? It was what, is it, what do you mean, low, low point is? It's the sort of the, uh, it was all, the all is lost. I'm sorry, yes. page 17, Ends the first act, page 85 ends the second act, page 86 to 110 is the end of the third act. That was his original. I'm sorry, can <laughs> I ask you to repeat it once more? I'm sure. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> it was page 1 to 17 is the first act, page 18 to 85 is the second act, page 86 to 110 is the third act. Don't go over 110, particularly if you're new. <laughs> 18 to 85. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Brooks, I need to thank you so much. And I would like you to elaborate on how you took the Lou Grant character from Mary Tyler Moore, a hilarious 30-minute comedy, and transformed it into a one-hour drama that I never missed. <laughs> and I'm from the US Virgin Islands, by the way. And I didn't miss one of your shows in over, I won't say how many years, because that'll give too much away. Thank you so much. Um, we, we basically agreed to come up with a show for Ed Asner, we're, you know, and, uh, and we were having a hard time and Ed came in and he said, you know, I don't mind that character that I've been playing. I, I wouldn't mind doing him more. And then we were thinking, what makes it fresh? And the fresh is it, you keep the same character but you change form. That was it. Okay. So when you gave Jack Nicholson the worst direction for that day? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I, 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 I don't remember. This, by the way, this he did this every day, so it wasn't just one thing. This was well, can you, can he'd you come up behind me at a certain point in the day and tell me and tell me you want to know your, you know. All right. I th and it Fair was enough. great. Yeah. I don't want to press you. I just like uh, I, I'm yeah. really interested. Like, what's the biggest mistake you've made as a director? Um. Yeah, I don't know. I, that, 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 I, I, I mean, there's. That's fair too. Yeah. It, it usually, the big. I mean, the big mistake is something fundamental, you know, a real fundamental assumption you make that's wrong at its core, and then everything stems from that. That's the scary one. Thanks. What was that first experience with? With who? With that. In terms of endearment. Mr. Brooks, hi. Um, I know everybody's telling you that they love you. I, I really love you. I, I, I mean it. I, I mean it. But um, I have kind of a two-parter question. Sorry, guys, but yeah, I have the mic. Um, but I, I'm wondering, um, kind of in general, first off, you have so many fabulous, specific qualities, just so many really quirky, memorable elements to your characters. And I was wondering um, if you would talk a little bit about how that comes about. Does I mean, do you develop that with the story before? I mean, is some of that coming about in filming? Is some of that coming through research? It, like when that happens? And then the specific thing I've got to ask, because I've wondered for years, um, Jack's OCD in As Good As It Gets, was that something that you started with with that character, or did you add it later because he was such a jackass, he, you needed something to make him like forgivable? 
there, 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 there was there was a draft by a wonderful writer that that you know that that you know it was, it was this was a really collaborative script, but it, the the draft that I was working off of, uh, he did not have anything clinical. A lot of the behavior was there, but there wasn't a clinical reason. So I thought it needed a clinical reason, and once we had a clinical reason, I don't think the picture could have, thinking back, I don't think it would have had anything going just past page 85 uh, if, if, you know, because I think it was so key that he went and started to take medication again. I think that was so key to the love story that, that and I didn't think of that when I gave him the clinical, but, but, but it helped throughout, I think. Because it, it sort, of, sort of represented a step in his cure, too, at the end. Hi, good evening. Um, no disrespect to the lady before me, but I love you more. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know. I'm not going to be able to write this script. <laughs> I'm not gonna You've been I'm paralyzed dead. now. I'm yeah, I, you're I, dead. I, you got you know, like two I, weeks I, down to I work on your Milos <laughs> Foreman impression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell a well disguised assault when I feel one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but with all the scripts that you've written over the years and all the scripts that you've developed for other writers as well, is there a piece of advice that you had wished you had known as a young writer? that maybe you could let us know and help us out as young writers? I, I seriously think it's very hard to get past the self-doubt. The self-doubt is an enemy. Self-consciousness is an enemy. You know, anybody who's around you that makes you self-conscious, what you do to yourself to make yourself self-conscious, it's the it's the enemy of writing. It is, and 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 there's no one. You wrestle. Do you wrestle with that I regularly? Think so. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's. So I think the thing is recognition that that's not just you alone. Recognition that that comes with the territory, and just taking some courage from the fact that it's you know everybody. There's a great Ed Solomon quote that was in written by once, and I'm just paraphrasing. But he said someone asked him, "It's sort of what what, what was your day? What's your day?" And he says that he goes and he has coffee and he reads the paper and he tries to develop enough self-loathing. And when he has enough self-loathing, then he starts to write. <laughs> when he ha hates himself enough, then he can start writing. Hello, Mr. Brooks. Um, I was just wondering about writer's block and if there's oh. that's something that you struggle <laughs> with and if uh, you have any tricks or methods that you use to break out of it. Here's, here's the... Th here's the tough thing because I, uh, I've been taking an inordinate amount of time with, you know, and, I, and you know, you could call it a block. If you're legitimately in process, if you're legitimately preoccupied with the thing you're writing, then you have to say to yourself that the days you don't write are okay. You know, that, that something is cooking, that you're in service to it and, you know, and that it's not about turning out pages that day. So once, oh, I always try and make a thing, am I legitimately into this? And if I'm legitimately into this, I try and go easy on myself. You know, I don't think it would help if I didn't go easy on myself. I still, I think I'd still have the same problem writing those days. But, you know, that's, that's my theory on it for myself. Can anybody guys take one, one more? Hi. Um, I love you too. <laughs> and, I, and I think the reason why is that your writing has so much heart and your comedy has so much heart in it. And I think that's what draws people to it. And um, my question is, um, when, when you're first starting out writing comedy, would, would you, is it easier to write with a partner or, um, I mean, you know, you can do it on your own, but was it helpful to have a partner um, at Very first? much so for me, yeah. Very much so for me. And, and you know, and, and, I, and I quite recently, you know, every time I walk into the Simpsons show, there are many partners and, and you know, and, and yeah. Yeah, it's great. I mean, com and having community, one of the toughest things about writing alone is that you deprive community. And community is such a, such a essential thing to quality of life. And when you're just in a room alone, you, you're deprived of that, I think. So, so you try and make it work in another way. And television gives you constant community. I love you more with each show. <laughs> <laughs> You've had so many good ideas, or at least to me they seem like they're, they're fantastic ideas, but I know that at some point you had to pitch all of them. 
is there something that's been in common that you've discovered through the years how to um, get other people to see it, or is it just something that they either get it or they don't? Well, I'll tell you, you know, this is my theory about operating in Hollywood, that, that um, when you're, that you should go and sell yourself on days when you're delusional with confidence. <laughs> And, and, and just as tempting as it is to go out and get somebody to hold your hand on those days with your, where, you, where you have the self-loathing, don't, don't leave your room. Don't let anybody see you. I, th I really believe that. You mean in terms of going into pitch? Yeah, how going do you into how pitch do you or, just, or just being around people who will, you know. You know I mean, there, there are all so many ways in Hollywood where, where, where no matter if you feel wretched, where somebody says, how are you, as if they're really interested <laughs> and really care. And if you take that bait, you know, you're dust. Oh, you, th <laughs> <laughs> you, think you, you think you should not publicize that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you asked, man. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, Wes Anderson and uh, how you came across Bottle Rockets and what you actually worked with him about, you know, what, what did you develop with him to bring to the script and also what you thought about his work since then? I, I love Wes, and, and, and uh, he, he, Bottle Rocket, went at the time that I saw it, they, I saw a short they did, I saw it with the actors that were in it, and, uh, and then how there was that, a script. How did that come to you? How did that come to uh, you? Through, uh, through somebody who was working with me, and you know, we, we have a production company and it came in. And, um, and then we went down to Texas to meet with them, because I loved the short so much and it was so fresh, and they had a 200-page script and almost everybody who was in the movie was living in the same <laughs> one-room apartment. <laughs> and for some reason, even though they've had this 200-page script for a while, all living in the same one-room apartment, they had never read it out loud. And it was interminable. It was, <laughs> it was crazy how long it was. I write long. This was, this was beyond anything. This was beyond consciousness. You, you, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you just lose it and then you come home and they were still doing this movie. They were still doing this movie. You'd eat something and they were still doing this movie. <laughs> and, and, and I remember we came out of it. <laughs> and and Wes, 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 Wes came to me and he, and he, and he, said, and he said, are you going to make it? I said, I, said, I don't know. Uh, 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 I said, it's really long. I think, I think it's really good that you heard it and you can start, are you going to make it? And, that's, and, that, and he kept on saying that. <laughs> and, um, and then we brought him to Hollywood and he and Owen would come in. It was the most unusual sessions I ever had. Uh, and they were a writing team. And I'd, um, and I'd talk and I'd you know, just say whatever I had to say and whatever my notes were and, and you know. And you'd, and you'd never, not only would they not say anything, and these went on for a while, not only would they not say anything, you could never catch them as a writing team exchanging a look to each other. <laughs> so so it, was the, it was the oddest thing. But then they'd come back and it was clear some of the notes that was helpful and it set them off in this part or something like that. And, um, and it, was, it came at a tough point. We, our company was in a tough point and we had a movie that at the first preview everybody you know, almost everybody walked out. I mean, it's just, you know, Bottle out. Rocket. And it was essentially the same picture. It was just, you know, it was just an original film with original voice, and it was brutal. And the great thing for me, and, and, and one of the great meanings to me, aside from the fact that so, so many great film t talents were in that as a first film, the, 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 and, and, and the worst curse, because their short had been at Sundance, and Sundance rejected the movie. And, it, and, that, and Wes, who's, uh, who's one of the toughest guys I know, and, you know, you, I mean, you could break boards on his head. <laughs> and, I mean, and this wiped him out, that Sundance, which was his pride, you know, rejected him. And, and, uh, and so there was the great moment that we all hung together in this adversity, that, we, that nobody abandoned ship, which was very good soul food, I think. And then there was, like, a, again, a blessing. Because the Los Angeles Times in their review of the film, which was a rave, and it made a lot of 10 best lists, which was great, and it launched all these careers, which was great. But that LA Times review not only raved about the movie, but took Sundance to task and spanked Sundance yeah. for not admitting it. So that was great. Uh, Mr. Brook, my name is Roger Montgomery. You mentioned about characters on the show, on The Simpsons, about giving them names. Uh, of course, my last name is Montgomery. Uh, how do you come up with the characters' names? They all fit each other very well. Well, Matt Groening named most of the main characters off his family. I mean, that's you know, so that was simple. 
<laughs> it doesn't get easier than that. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Oh, uh, you know, it was great because our whole approach, you know, there was, uh, there was, uh, there was Matt who was doing, you know, who was, uh, you know, an animator cartoonist and, and there was Sam Simon who had done, worked on Taxi with me but had also worked on daytime animation and there was me. And for the first three years of The Simpsons, we refused to y almost tell or say the word animation. We treated it as a family, we treat, you know, so, and we were so obsessive on that. And I think that's one of the good things. We had so many tight rules, and then we began to let go of the rules one by one, so. Hi, uh, I know in your movies, um, a lot of times there are these moments, and romantic comedies in general, where they're like moments of great sort of sentiment or really powerful moments, but they, you know, could almost spill over and become too sentimental, like, I don't know, when Helen Hunt goes over to kiss him and it's good as it gets, or, you know. Wait, wait, tell me when Helen Hunt does what? Like when she goes over to kiss him and as good as it gets in the restaurant. Yeah. Or, or like in, you know, Jerry Maguire, like you had me at hello and there are a lot of moments in that movie. How do you sort of know when that's going to sort of spill over and become too sort of sentimental or it's sort of just right, it's just at that sort of pitch perfect level? Uh, uh, I and where, I do those, where do they come from? Too? I think if you, if you worry, I think you'd rather err on the side of too sentimental and risk that. That's the risk you're taking. That's the chance you're taking than playing it safe and living in fear of that. That's great. All right. Well, I think that's uh, I'm going to wrap it up. We're going to let we're going to let Jim uh, rest up and get back to writing. And um, thank you very much.